last panel we talked about uh, the work of Washington getting yeah. done and the um, real work of Washington gets done in the evenings. That's when you find out what's really going on and the inside scoop. And there is no better person to be at dinner with than David Frum. So I know this isn't like a salon dinner with 12 people, more like a thousand, but I want us to treat it that way, which is to talk about what's really going on with the utmost candor. Um, I think most folks in the room know who you are. Um, David writes for The Atlantic. He's on CNN. He's just written a fabulous book, Trumpocracy. Um, he is a Republican, but he's OK in that um, <laughs> He's learning along the way. Um, he was the uh, speechwriter for uh, George W. Bush. He um, has, uh, in 2016, he voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, and May of last year, asked that the president resign. So an unusual, well-informed Republican. And so want to talk about the state of our union, um, where the US is in terms of geopolitics. Um, what is this Mueller investigation? What does the Nunez men memo really mean? Fake news, is there such a thing? And then what can we as citizens do? So. State of the Union. All right, so I think people need to appreciate, I know you all price political risk into all of your calculations. Um, I, I would, and I don't know how all of you price it, but I am guessing most of you are probably underpricing it because we are heading into a, a very difficult and dangerous year in 2018. And the prosperity that the country is now enjoying may tend to make the danger perversely worse. It will make it worse because I expect one of the things that will happen in 2018 is that the president's numbers will strengthen. Uh, we've already, that's already begun to happen. I mean, his numbers remain terrible, but they're quite a bit less terrible than they were three months ago. And that's the effect of, of, uh, of uh, this, the cumulative effect of the economic growth has been tightening labor markets, so wages are rising. And people will begin to see, not everybody, not Californians, because it's at your expense, but people um, in the president's constituencies will see some improvement in their after-tax income. As the president becomes stronger, his party in Congress is becoming weaker. Uh, the Republicans are heading for a bad year in 2018. Probably not as bad as everybody thinks right now, but a, a, problem, a bad enough year. It takes Three house, it takes three political branches, House, Senate, and President, to pass a tax cut, but it takes only one of them to defend the tax cut, and they will want to defend it. And so as the party p position weakens, as the President's position gets a little bit stronger, they will cling more tightly to him. The basis of the relationship between Trump and the congressional Republicans has always been an exchange. He, is not inter he doesn't have political ideas in the ordinary sense of the word, um, they, but they do. They, there are a lot of things they want to accomplish. He will give them signatures, they give him protection. Protection both from his vulnerabilities for financial wrongdoing and protections, uh, protection from the national security dangers that he's accumulating. And what we have seen, we can talk about this in a minute, in this Nunes story, is an, a, an indication of how far the congressional Republicans will go to protect the president. So a lot of focus on the State of the Union was how we are making America great again. And um, you've spent a lot of time thinking about the Trump voter mm -hmm. and what they're getting out of this deal. And how's it working out for them? Um, they're getting, I mean, the country is, is more prosperous. Um, it, you should not think, when you think of the Trump voter, um, you should not think of the most hard scrabble people in America. Um, the most hard scrabble people in America don't are outside the political system. The best description I've ever heard of a Trump voter, the true Trump voter, mm -hmm. is a successful person or really a successful man in an unsuccessful place. 
Think of the vice president, sorry, the vice principal of the of a high school in some deindustrializing town. He's got a steady job. He sees deterioration around him. He's a functional person. Um, he believes something can and should be done, and it's not obvious what that thing should be. Um, so, and those voters have been quite loyal to the president. When you think, though, about the year ahead and the making America great prop, what on the world stage, and this is maybe the most important part of the political risk, um, the, the situation again becomes more and more dangerous. We are alienating friends, and I, I fear very much we're on a path to conflict in Northeast Asia. So David coined the phrase, axis of evil. At that point in 2002, it was Iraq, Iran, North Korea. What is the axis of evil now? Well, what, what that phrase tried to explain was something that everybody today, or just about everybody, would acknowledge that was true, but at the time was actually strangely controversial. Um, we all now know that the North Koreans and the Iranians have swapped technologies. Uh, that the, uh, the Iran, Iran got the benefit of North Korean nuclear technology in exchange for missile technology. We know that North Korea helped Syria with the uh, nuclear program that the Israelis um, blew up in 2007, I think it was. Um, we know that Iran funded Hamas and Hezbollah, even though one was Sunni and the other was Shiite. Um, in 2002, it was a clever thing to say that all of these things that were happening could not happen. And so the president was trying to explain that the United States fr confronted not a, a phalanx, not united set of enemies, but interlinked networks of threat around the issue of the distribution of weapons of mass destruction, and especially nuclear technology. Um, and that was an alarm he tried to sound in that speech. Um, the speech became very controversial. I think of actually, if you pick it up and read it today, you will see very little that you would disagree with. So 16 years later, who are our real enemies? Well, 16, 16 years later, um, our, on the world stage, you face the nuisance countries, mm -hmm. uh, North Korea and Iran. Uh, you face um, the mischief makers in Russia, and you face the longer term challenge of China. And it's not, I don't think it's right to call China an enemy, it's a, but it's a rival. And one of the things that is so dangerous about the Trump years is the Chinese, a lot of things that are terrible about the Chinese system, but there's one thing that if you're a Chinese neighbor, uh, you can take for granted, which is they're very predictable. Um, you know where you stand, you have a good idea what they will do, you have a good idea what they will not do. As the United States becomes unpredictable, we become a source of insecurity. I mean, think of it from the point of view of somebody in South Korea. Uh, they know exactly where they stand with the Chinese, uh, they know what they will have to pay for protection if China, from China. With the United States, I mean, they, they hear talk of preemptive war from the United States in their neighborhood. Um, if, it's a very compressed, compressed space. Uh, and one of the things that really is alarming about the year, Donald Trump has not had very many enjoyable days as president. But the, one, one of his best days, maybe the very best day, was the day he fired those 60 cruise missiles. Uh, into Syria. It was beautiful. Bang, bang. Uh, no return address. Nothing happened. And he got fantastic cable news yeah. coverage. Cable loves those images. Um, and I worry a lot that that left him with a false idea of what a military commitment looks like. Uh, and it left him with a false idea of the media rewards. And, and this guy with media, he's like, if you ever, if you own a Labrador retriever and have ever held a dog biscuit in front of it and watched its eyes move, um, <laughs> This is our president. <laughs> That's, I mean, that he crave, he craves media acclaim, and he and the thing, and he shows it. You know, there was a wonderful moment in one of the John F. Kennedy press conferences, uh, where he was asked, "What do you think of the new, of the press you get?" And he referenced there's an um, there's a cigarette ad in the early '60s that said that asked, "Are you smoking more and enjoying it less?" And President Ken Kennedy answered, "I'm reading the newspapers more and enjoying them less." And it was a funny line. Mm -hmm. It's probably very true. But he didn't show the need. This president shows the need. North Korea. I mean, it, it feels like um, two months ago we were all at high panic. We are you, on the West Coast, which you, you officially be, refer to as the best coast. You, sh uh, you should be alarmed. And what you should be alarmed about is this is all happening. One of the, Donald Trump, and I describe this in the book, mm -hmm. Donald Trump is not an intentional dictator, exactly. Don, um, what Donald Trump is is somebody first who's got... A lot of, he's got a, this terrible scandal with the Russians over his head. Got a long record of financial dodgy dealings. 
um, is impatient of any kind of restraint um, and is breaking the system, both for rational reasons of self-protection, he's breaking the FBI for rational reasons of self-protection, and he also breaks things because he just cannot do anything but break them. And so he's breaking like, the, the institutions like the National Security Council and all the ways that the United States makes foreign policy. I mean, it is uh, no one more admirable in American life than the senior leaders of the military. But you cannot have a discussion based only on military leaders because as impressive a group of people as they are, they have their own lopsided experiences. You need other people at the table. And the other people in this administration don't get much of a hearing. So have we had a military coup? Um, we are, I have a chapter in the book called Autoimmune Defi uh, Disorders that describes how in reaction to the intrusion of the Trump presidency, different parts of the government are doing things that are completely rational and indeed patriotic from the point of view of that agency at that time, but that together are breaking some of the traditions of civilian control of our institutions. Um, I'll give you one very concrete example. Every day the president gets a thing called the President's Daily Brief. So the most precious secrets of the United States. And typically, the, of course, the president gets it. Um, National Security Advisor gets it. Typically, the chief of staff gets it. Um, one or two others, Bill Clinton allowed Hillary Clinton, the first lady, to read it. And a redacted version of this is, is shared then with past presidents. So it's typically a group of four, five, sometimes six extremely senior people, every one of whom is exactly known and has the most intense stake in the success of the administration. Donald Trump's brief is shared with 14 people, including his son-in-law, about uh, who has all of these unexplained connections to foreign financial institutions and who owes a lot of money to a lot of people. One of the old rules of government is you couldn't be in government if you owed a lot of money because it meant people had power over you. Um, that was one of the real things that, that they asked at a security clearance, did you have debts? And if you have debts, you have a way to pay them. You can have a mortgage, but if you have like, say a couple of billion dollars of unsecured credit, uh, that might make you vulnerable. Um, this seems like a good time to segue into Russia and uh, <laughs> everything that has happened there. Um, Congress realizing that Russia had effectively hacked our election, um, passed sanctions um, by one of the, the, the largest, almost unanimous vote in the Senate, 98 to 2, um, and there were three dissenters on, on the House side. Um, the president signed the legislation. He has yet to enforce it. Right. In fact, he said, Meh. Well, it's, it's worse than that. I mean, it really is alarming. So in the past week, all three um, heads of the Russian intelligence services were in Washington, secretly. One of them was a sanctioned person. So somebody would have had to give him, that, given him a waiver to mm -hmm. let him in the country. They had meetings at, at the CIA. And after the meetings, um, the president chose not only not to put all of the sanctions in effect, but instead of the sanctions, I mean, which he had the power to do, um, sanctions, he can always waive them, instead of the sanctions, that the administration was supposed to publish a list of the hun uh, they had a list of the people who were closest to Vladimir Putin, the oligarch list. And this, this would be something that would be useful for enforcing the sanctions in the Magnitsky Act. These are pre-existing sanctions. These are the things that the Russians really hate because they directly touch the Putin inner circle. And what it turned out they did is instead of producing a proper list using the unbelievable intelligence gathering capabilities of the United States, is they reproduced a list from Forbes.ru of 95 rich people in Moscow, um, some of whom were Putin opponents, by the way, um, and, um, and some of whom were, you know, are people who are not especially close to him. And they, they plagiarized that and presented that as the work of the United States government. So it indicates they're not very serious about this. You know, but where's Paul Ryan? Where are the Republicans pushing back and complicit. saying? Complicit. They're totally complicit. The essence, because the thing I, the reason I use this term Trumpocracy as opposed to anything to do with Donald Trump personally, is the president does not govern, it's not a one man show. Even if the president were a lot harder working and better informed than Donald Trump, it cannot be a one man show. It is uh, that the power of Donald Trump is the power of a system. It rests on the complicity of members of Congress. It rests on control of the executive branch. And so, as I said, they have that deal. Trump signs legislation. They give him protection. So that brings us to special counsel Robert Mueller III, otherwise known as Bobby Three Stick. Um, 
for people who have day jobs, who are building companies, um, there's a lot going on, but it's so much noise, it's almost like you can't track what's actually happening. Where, where is Mueller in the investigation? He's in terrible danger right now. That's what this whole Nunes nonsense is, is about. That um, every person who has, who's been in the law enforcement chain of command that is supposed to get to the bottom of this, because what, what happened with Russia is, I don't want to use the term to hack the election, but that suggests that they tampered with the voting. And, as, and although they did try to do that, as far as we can tell, they failed. They were defeated by the sheer chaos and um, uh, disorganization of the American voting system. It turned out that, that although they made a number of attempts, they were not able to do it so far as anybody knows. But they did get information and they did use that information. Um, and it certainly looks like there was coordination between the Russians and the, Trump, and, the, and the Trump campaign. It's clear that we know that there was attempted coordination. They actually had a meeting about it, as the whole world knows. And there's a question mark over whether there's a flow of information back from the Trump campaign to the Russians. That is not known. It smells that way, but you cannot say it. that that is not known Usually yet. Usually in Washington, when you have this much smoke, there is a serious fire burning. But, so let's, yeah, so let's you worry about that. About so, so, but, so what is happening with this um, Nunes business is this is, the House, this is the effort of the House Republicans to support Donald Trump in discrediting the investigators, to give them a justification either for firing them or more probably what is more likely to happen is when the Mueller report comes to d give Republicans an excuse for ignoring it, backing the president and saying we, we will not take action on these findings. So is it a good idea generally to attack the FBI for the long run? Well, it's a terrible idea if you're trying to run a law, rule of law society with a politically independent police force. But, you know, one of the rules, there's a saying in Washington, the cover-up is always worse than the crime. That really depends on what the crime is. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got a dead body in the bathtub up upstairs on the second floor of the White House, cover-up may be your best option. Mm -hmm. So what is the timing? People keep waiting for the investigation to close and you know they're, they're waiting for that next step. Well, I, I have no idea what the timing is, but um, this is part of bracing yourself for risk and crisis ahead. Because here, here is, a, a, I think, a very possible, maybe a highly possible outcome of the Mueller investigation. Um, what did the Trump people do that was legally wrong? I mean, it's illegal to hack, and it's illegal directly to receive a hack. So there, there, are some, there are some risks for them in that body of law. It's illegal to receive um, a thing of value, for a campaign to receive a thing of value from a foreign entity. And there's an argument that information could be a thing of value, uh, that, although there's an argument that it might not be. But on the core offense of sitting down, having a meeting, working with a foreign intelligence agency and ha saying, how can we work together to win this election? That is probably not illegal. Um, it's undemocratic, it's un-American, it's unpatriotic, it, it's shocking, it's scandalous. But one of the things that may come from this investigation is Mueller may find a series of technical violations of law, uh, Foreign Agents Registration Act, um, election law, but he may confront the biggest scandal in American electoral history. Mm -hmm. and say, I don't see a legal violation here. And then Mueller will have to decide, what does he do about that? Does he close his books? Does he make a report to the Congress? And if he reports to the Congress and, say, and says, no laws were broken, but we have this fact pattern that is very disturbing, what does Congress do? And I think this present Congress is ready to say, well, if no laws were broken... No harm, no foul. Um, it ain't beanbag. Yeah. Um, which gets us, you know, fake news, alternative facts. Well, well fake, fake news was a phrase coined to describe a very real thing, uh, which is the del deliberate creation of politically useful disinformation um, by sinister actors, foreign and domestic, in order to achieve a, a political end. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump has applied that term to accurate in, uh, reporting that he finds inconvenient. Um, but it is, it's really important to understand how, how the fake news worked and how it worked in tandem with the 
Trump campaign. The single most read piece of fake news in the 2016 cycle was a story that was created that said that the Pope, Pope Francis, had endorsed Donald Trump. And it was originally created in June, and then it was recirculated in October. Um, now, those, you will remember that in April, Donald Trump had a Twitter fight mm -hmm. with the Pope. One of the rules of American politics used to be, don't get into Twitter fights with the Pope. Uh, <laughs> but he got into a Twitter fight with the Pope. So this was a point of vulnerability. They, they, somebody recognized that Donald Trump had a problem with culturally conservative Catholics, who are very important in the upper Midwest, the area where the election was decided. And this fake story was created and then circulated through Facebook. More than a million people saw it in the month of October, claiming that there was a papal endorsement of Donald Trump. When the Podesta dump hit, within 45 minutes, by the way, after the Access Hollywood tape was released, somebody had, somebody had timed this very well. Um, one of the things that was weaponized inside the Podesta dump was there were two exchanges of emails that in which people who were Catholic themselves expressed doubts about Catholic teaching on sexuality and the role of women that are shared, I looked it up, by about 75% of American Catholics. But you could misrepresent this material as an indication that the Hillary Clinton campaign had said some things that were disrespectful and slighting about Catholic, not Catholic teaching about the role of women in sexuality, but about Catholics as a group of people. And combined with the fake news that, about the papal endorsement, which resurfaced at almost exactly this time, on a, this time with much more money behind it and was paid, you could create a narrative that was the merit narrative shared. And then the Trump people campaigned on this. That within 24 hours of the Access Hollywood tape, Mike Pence was going out there and saying that Catholics had been insulted. All people of faith had been insulted. This was the Kellyanne Conway talking point. This was Donald Trump's own talking point. Uh, we know how devoted Donald Trump is to the Christian religion. Um, and um, uh, this, it comes together in a way that is extremely suggestive. Does the president lie? Does he know he's lying? Does uh, he have a hard time with the truth? Uh, Does he I, have his own truth? Um, I, I don't think the president is, I think the president has um, psychological issues. I don't think he's crazy in the sense that he cannot tell truth from falsehood. Mm -hmm. I, mean, he, I mean, I think he lies to himself, of course, uh, he needs to for various reasons, but he lies strategically. Um, you know, when he insists, when he tells this ridiculous story about how he had the most watched State of the Union of all time, okay, I mean, he quoted in that same tweet the number, the exact number of people who watched it, which he got from watching Fox and Friends, which had had the number on like 10 minutes before. Um, so he knows it's that number. Mm -hmm. um, he needs it for his own ego purposes to be the biggest ever, but he also needs to tell this story that he is a massively popular figure. And he creates all kinds of lies to that effect, the fake voting and so on. And that then is a resource for people around the president who will not, who will flinch from an outright lie, but as vice president, members of his team, to create the impression, well, that's what the American people, the job the American people elected him to do. That's who Donald Trump is. He speaks for America. And, and that, um, that they want to read out of the country a whole lot of people belong to the country. So the, the next obvious check on this White House is the election. And as you stated at the beginning, the president's getting stronger, the party is uniting behind him. But we've also seen record retirements. Mm -hmm. We have three senators, Republican senators who aren't running again. We have 34 House members who are not running again, 10 of whom are chairmen of committees. And all it takes is for the Democrats to win 24 seats. Yeah. And it's expected that 80 seats will be in play. What's going to happen? Well, of course, I don't know. But I will. I, let me make two observations. In the years when the House has flipped in recent times, uh, 2010 or 2014, the House didn't flip, but it was a big wave election, and 2006. Um, all of those were years when something was really seriously, obviously wrong with the country. An unsuccessful war in 2006, serious economic trouble in 2010 and 2014. Those conditions are absent. So uh, I, I, don't, I can't think of a time when in the absence of a, foreign, of a, a serious foreign policy conflict or serious economic trouble, the party of the president has taken massive losses simply on the strength of revulsion against the personality of the president. It could happen. 
Um, the president's approval rating is a very powerful indicator. Mm -hmm. I talk about that in the book. When the president is below 50%, um, that's a powerful indicator of how, of how many seats are going to be lost. But another point to remember, they're Democrats. Um, <laughs> they do Democratic things. And just the Republican base is small, but the Democratic base is smaller. And the shutdown fa fight was an example of the terrible political instincts of the leadership of the Democratic Party, and more specifically, how the needs of the 2020 presidential candidates are pushing the party into places that make it uncompetitive. And I'll be very concrete about this. Uh, the Democrats shut down the government for over two issues, children's health insurance program and some kind of uh, path to citizenship for illegal aliens known as the DACA group. The Republicans instantly surrendered as soon as the Democrats shut down the government, the Republicans instantly surrendered on CHIP, on the Children's Health Program, as was predictable, converting the shutdown into a fight over illegal aliens. Um, the Democrats were, the Democrats in, con in the House and Senate, or especially the senators, were horrified by this, but the 2020 people liked it because they think this is going to be a very important issue in the, pri in the primary struggles. So the needs of the 2020 candidates push the Democratic Party in the House and Senate into a dangerous place. And they are going to wear the shutdown. Um, it's, I, I mean, think people we're going to have a couple more shutdowns before but if the, it, but we it, get it, to it's an the election. And there, there is a lot of governing that needs to happen when you have Republicans in control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, and lurching from continuing resolution to continue resolution as we're hurling into a debt limit vote. Um, you know, no one is distinguishing themselves so in this, this is not a moral time point. period. This is not a moral point. Yeah. This, this is a, a, a practical point. Yeah. That the, the, Democratic the Democratic presidential party has always has been, through our adult lifetimes, a very realistic party, the party of Bill Clinton. It is about to become as ideological as the House Republicans are. Um, so you're a Republican. Mm -hmm. There are Republicans in this room. Who is your candidate? Where is your hope? Where is your party? Um, it's, a, it's a bigger problem that, that, that the Republican, pro I mean, you don't solve this by finding some person mm -hmm. and putting your hope in that person. Um, and the Republicans have been through that. This is, we, we have got, we're dealing with a gradual accumulating post over the past decade and a half accumulating crisis in the American political system. Donald Trump did not make up this crisis. He exploited it. He saw its possibilities. He has used it. And he has dragged the Congressional Republican Party with him. But um, anybody who says, and therefore the answer is, vote for Joe Bloggs for president in the Republican primary, and Donald Trump, barring a health event, is going to be an overwhelmingly strong candidate for renomination in 2020. So um, finishing up with the last uh, question, in the book, um, one of the things that I really liked was the emphasis on that we can all choose our future, mm -hmm. um, that this is not merely submitted to us, right. other than buying this fabulous book. To, well, there are free copies in the lobby. You don't even have to buy it. Which is even better. Um, how can people in this audience help? change the, the, the course well, the, or create a different future? Well, the, look, the most inspiring thing that has happened over the past year, the most hopeful sign, has been the rising level of civic engagement. And everybody who works in my industry has felt it. It's not just that people are reading us more, but they're reading us in a different way, with more intensity, with more sense that it matters. So that's been very exciting. But I think one of the pieces of advice um, I, I give people when they ask this question is to remember, if you're carrying a smartphone in your pocket, and I assume every, in a crowd like this, every single person is, you are commanding right now more broadcast power than Walter Cronkite ever deployed. Use it wisely. You are not just a news consumer, you are a news publisher. And anyone who has got any influence presence on social media is a very powerful news publisher. Have, have your own standards. Start with that. Click the links. There is, uh, many people here are liberals and Democrats, there is a rising market in fake news aimed at you. Do not succumb to it. Um, and Use, your, use the power that modern communications technology puts into your hands. Use it responsibly as a consumer and as a disseminator. David from Smart, Brave Republican, thank you very thank much. You.